Folks, one more word on the banquet. I think I forgot to say this. We will have child care available. And so if you have kids, you can still come. Take your Bible and open it again with me today to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. You know, when we began our study of this epistle, we said that it is really rich. It's vacuum-packed. And what that means, practically speaking, is that to understand it well, you really have to study it diligently. That's particularly true with certain parts of this letter, including our text today. Look at your Bible. 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to read this morning to get started uh, verses 4 through 12. And the main part of our text is going to be 4 through 10, but we're going to cover 11 and 12 a little bit at the end, and then hopefully next week we'll come back to verses 11 and 12 as we uh, get into the other part of the letter here. Let's go ahead and look at your Bible and uh, read along with me, if you would. Peter says, As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture. Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you, as sojourners and exiles, to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. And you can see the challenges there, right? You can see the challenges there. You almost need to take a deep breath after reading all of that because there are a lot of layers there. There are a lot of layers. This is a challenging text, but we'll be helped today by the fact that Peter never strays far from his main theme. Remember, Peter wrote to Christians who were experiencing persecution. And his message to them was that they possessed a salvation so great, so complete, so wonderful that they could rejoice in every circumstance. There was nothing that they could encounter in life that they could not rejoice in. That's the promise at the heart of Peter's letter. That's the promise at the heart of this particular text. Even in the midst of intensifying persecution and trials, believers can experience joy. They can experience joy by fixing their hope on the greatness of their salvation in Christ. To lay claim to that promise, and I think that we want to do this. To lay claim to that promise, Peter called on the believers he wrote to, to see and to embrace three blessed results of their salvation in Christ. You have these in your notes. Their salvation had reversed their status from spiritually dead to being spiritually alive and eternally alive. Secondly, their salvation had reversed their position. They'd been profane sinners. Their salvation made them priests. And thirdly, their salvation had reversed their purpose from self-centered pursuits to proclaiming the excellencies of Christ. Let's talk about that first reversal. Let's talk about the reversal of the status of the believers. And what we mean is what their salvation had done for them generally. 
And I think if we're going to talk about this, we need to really think about what life had been like for them before coming to Christ. And the reality is that life for them before coming to Christ was like our lives before coming to Christ. For believing in Jesus, these believers had been lost, and they had been lost seemingly without hope. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2. There's a text here in Ephesians chapter 2 that works really well to remind us of what it is to believe. Because it looks back on our lives before coming to Christ. It's a text with universal application. It's going to work, I think, to make the point that we're up to today. Look at this, Ephesians chapter 2. Paul is writing to the Ephesians here, but certainly this was true of the believers to whom Peter wrote. Look at this. Uh, he says, Paul says, you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. See, that's the life that we all lived. That's the life that these believers had lived before coming to Christ. Keep reading verse 3. Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. Now look at this. Like the rest of mankind. What's Paul saying there? Well, Paul is saying there that that's the status of all people in their natural born state, right? Men are sinners. They're naturally born sinners. Paul is just fleshing that out a little bit here. He's telling us about what they're like in their natural born state. That's true of the believers that Peter wrote to before they came to Christ. That was true of you before you came to Christ. That is descriptive of me before I came to Christ. Men are naturally born sinners. They're children of wrath and line for judgment. But I love this text in Ephesians because it gives us both sides, right? It gives us that pre-conversion life. It gives us then life after coming to Christ. And so what we just looked at, thankfully, that's not the end of the story. Keep reading. Look at verse 4. But God. And we all rejoice in that. God's intervention, right? But God, being who He is eternally, that is being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us. Look at this. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, He made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and He raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. You see, that is the reversal of status that we're talking about. That is the reversal of status that we're talking about. It's the reversal of status that every believer in Jesus experiences. They're, sma they're snatched from spiritual death by God and they're given eternal life in His Son. And that eternal life comes with all kinds of riches and blessings. That's the reversal of status. In Colossians 1, 13 and 14, Paul describes... This reversal of status this way, he says, He has delivered us, that is, God has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. See, that's the same reversal. And turn now back to 1 Peter chapter 2 where Peter describes the reversal in his own way. Peter describes the reversal by uniquely using some Old Testament terminology. Look at verse 4. Look at how Peter describes this reversal. He says, As you come to Him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious. Look at this, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house. Now there's a lot there. 
But I want you to notice simply, first of all, that the initial emphasis there is on Jesus. Right? You see that. The initial emphasis is on Jesus. Peter says that Jesus is a, look at this, he says he's a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious. What's that a description of? What is that a description of? Well, that is a description of the Lord's incarnation, right? Think about the Lord's incarnation. He was, Jesus was, largely rejected by men. Isn't that right? Largely rejected by men. But do you remember what the Father said about the Son at His baptism? He said, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. The incarnation of Jesus, including a sacrifice on the cross for our sins, was according to the Father's plan. The statement here is that Christ, the Son, the cornerstone, is absolutely precious to the Father. But I want you to notice here also that title, Living Stone. Right? Jesus is the Living Stone. I want you to notice that title because it's a Messianic title. It's a Messianic title that's deeply rooted in Old Testament Scripture. Look at verse 6. Peter explains it further. He says, For it stands in Scripture. In other words, he says, it is written. It stands. It stands in Scripture. God has said, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone. A cornerstone chosen and precious. Now look at this. And whoever believes in Him will not be put to shame. Peter is quoting Isaiah 28, 16 there, and he takes that messianic prophecy that Isaiah gave us and he applies it directly, exclusively, specifically to Christ. That's a prophecy that promised the coming of the Messiah. And you see, Peter looks at this and he writes it out and he says, that's Jesus. He says, Jesus is the cornerstone. He is the one who has been written of in Scripture. He says, Jesus is the Savior this is what I want you to notice, uh, what Peter says about him. Peter says, whoever believes in him, whoever believes in Christ, whoever believes in this cornerstone, what? Whoever believes in him, look at this, will not be put to shame. Let me paraphrase that for you. Peter says there, whoever believes in Jesus receives eternal life. As verse 5 says, those who come to Him become living stones. Right? Those who come to Him, those who come to Jesus believing, they become living stones, meaning they receive His salvation. They're delivered by God from the kingdom of this world, and they're transferred over into the kingdom of Christ. There's another thing you might want to notice here as you look at living stones. That'll tie the, that title that's applied to believers, Living Stones, that's a title of identification, and it's one that implies ownership, right? It includes ownership. What's the statement there? The statement there is that believers are the Lord's people. And as such, as the people of God, as the people of Christ, they possess all the blessings that go along with belonging to Him. See, that's the Christian's great reversal of status. By the way, I hope you see this uh, consistent with Peter's message. That's the reason why Christians can, rezo- they can rejoice in any circumstance. Let's look at the second blessed result. The second blessed result of the believer's salvation is what we'll call the reversal of their position. We've looked at the reversal of their status. Look now at the reversal of their position. Remember, we made the point that like all Christians, the believers Peter wrote to had been formerly dead in trespasses and sins. They'd walked according to the course of the world. They had followed after the enemy. 
Put a little bit differently, they had been profane sinners, right? Just think about that description in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. You can take that and you can say the description there is of profane sinners. That's the way the people who Peter wrote to had been before coming to Christ. They had been profane sinners. They had been given to the world. They had been given to its ways. But what we just saw was that in Christ they had been rescued. He would come to them. They had embraced Him in faith, believed in Him. And he rescued them, right? He had snatched them out of the kingdom of the world, transferred them into his own kingdom. They'd been rescued, but folks, here's the thing. They had not only been rescued. They had not only been rescued. So complete was their reversal that in Christ they'd been made into priests. They'd been profane sinners, but so complete was their rescue that in Christ he took those profane sinners and he made them priests. Do you see that? Look at verse 5. Peter says, you yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house. Let's stop there for a moment. That's a statement of profound importance. It begins with this understanding. Peter is referencing a temple there, right? And in Scripture, I think you know this, in Scripture, the temple is seen as what? Well, the temple is seen in Scripture as having been the dwelling place of God among His people. Isn't that right? That's what the temple was all about. That's where you would find the dwelling presence of God in the midst of His people. You'd find that in the, in the, in the, the form of the temple. By the way, if you look back in the Old Testament, you'll find the glory of the Lord's presence. We've talked about that, right? The Shekinah glory. Remember the cloudy pillar? If you look back into the Old Testament, you'll find the glory of the Lord's presence, that manifest glory of His dwelling presence. You'll find there, remember, first of all, filling the tabernacle. One of the places you find that is in Exodus chapter 40, verse 34. Remember? Uh, the cloud descended and filled the tabernacle. That was the manifest dwelling presence of God. Uh, the priests would see that and they would know that God was there. It was an awesome thing to them. It was a frightening and a terrible thing, in a sense, in a good way. Then later on, you find the glory of the Lord's presence, the Shekinah glory filling the temple. Remember, you'll find that in 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 14. Solomon built the temple. It was dedicated. And the glory of the Lord filled the house. Remember? Uh, those priests ministering in it had to leave because so great was the awesomeness of the Lord's presence. Then maybe you remember Ezekiel chapter 10. Ezekiel chapter 10. In Ezekiel chapter 10, you find the Lord's glory departing the temple. Do you remember that? The people have become fully apostate. So in Ezekiel chapter 10, the glory of the Lord departs the temple. Uh, obviously, that was a tragic day. But here's the thing. The Lord's glory would return. The Lord's glory would return... His glory would return in an even greater way, listen to this, every single time Jesus walked the courts of the temple. Right? That was God's presence in a sense completely unfiltered. When Jesus showed up and walked around the temple, uh, that was a greater manifestation of the glory of God than even the Shekinah in a sense. But see this. The point of Peter's statement in verse 5, his initial statement, is that now, in the age of the church, believers in Jesus are His temple. Right? Believers in Jesus are His temple. The temple is gone, by the way. It was destroyed. But now, since the, days of, since the day of Pentecost, believers in Jesus are the Lord's temple. Listen, this is why. Because Jesus dwells within them through the Holy Spirit. You'll find that truth explained in John chapter 14, verses 17 and verse 23, among other places. Believers are the Lord's temple. There's even more that you need to take in, though, here. Not only are believers the Lord's temple, 
put just a little bit differently, not only does Jesus dwell in his people through the Holy Spirit, not only that, Peter tells us here that Jesus has made his people his priests. He's made his people his priests. Keep reading, look. Verse 5, you yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. Did you get that? To be a holy priesthood. To offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. That's another statement of profound importance that we need to dig into. I think we need to ask this question. What did it mean for these believers to have been made by the Lord into a holy priesthood? What did that mean for them? As believers today, I mean, the question is the same. What would that mean for us? Let's talk about that uh, through the eyes of these people to whom Peter wrote. What did it mean for them to have been made by the Lord into a holy priesthood? Well, to begin with, it meant this. To begin with, it meant that they had been chosen by God for special service. Right? You've got to understand that part. It's right there in the text. It's in black and white. It meant that they had been chosen by God for special service. Here's why I think that's especially significant here. Remember, we mentioned this earlier. Peter is deliberately drawing on Old Testament imagery here. Isn't that right? He's referring back to those prophecies, the prophecy of the cornerstone. He has the temple very much in mind here. Sacrifices are in mind here. Peter is deliberately drawing on Old Testament imagery. And in the Old Testament, here's what you need to understand. In the Old Testament, as you think about the priesthood, one did not volunteer to be a priest. It's not the way it worked. You didn't say, me, pick me. See, if you're going to be a priest, that's because you are of the people chosen for that service by the Lord. That's why in verse 9, Peter addresses the believers as what? As a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. See, the point there is that they'd been called out by God. They'd been picked out by God to be His priests. That calling included two incredible privileges. By the way, let's be clear that these privileges are for all believers. Peter addressed this letter to the believers in the churches in first century Asia Minor. Let's understand that its message is inscripturated for all believers. Here they are, two priestly privileges of believers that are essential to their calling. These were essential to the calling of those believers to whom Peter originally wrote. They're also essential to our calling. Two priestly privileges of believers. Here's the first one. The first priestly privilege possessed by every disciple of Jesus is access. It's access. In Christ, we have direct access to God. Do you know what that means? That means that as believers, we can freely enter into His presence. It means, folks, that we can do that at any time. And here's the great part. It means that we can do that without the assistance of a human intermediary. We don't need another priest. Why is that? That's because we're now priests. We can enter into the Lord's presence at any time without the assistance of a human intermediary like a priest. We can also do that without qualifying ritual. Ritual is not required for us to go into the Lord's presence. We have access. Here's the really good thing. Not only do we have access, the reality is that God invites us to come to Him. He beckons us to do so. Listen to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22. The writer of Hebrews says there, let us draw near. This is God's word to us. 
This is God saying to us, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith. Did you get that? In full assurance of faith. Having had our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. What's the point of that statement? Well, the point of that statement is that if you're in Christ, there's nothing holding you back. You can enter into God's presence at any time. You can do that to pray with Him, to commune with Him. You can do that uh, to study His Word with Him. You can do that to praise Him. That's what it means to have access. That's the first priestly privilege of every believer. We have access to God. That's no small thing. By the way, our access to God far surpasses the priest's access to God under the Old Covenant. Isn't that right? Remember what the Old Testament says, the way that the Old Testament describes this? Remember, there were priests in Israel. They were the intermediaries. They did have access to God, but it was only a conditional kind of access. Just as a, for instance, if you think about the access that we have where we can go right into the throne room, that was very different for the priests in the Old Testament. You need to remember this. It wasn't every priest that could enter into the Holy of Holies. By the way, do you remember where the Holy of Holies was? That was in the temple, right? It was inside the temple. It's kind of the heart of the temple. Remember, that's where the Ark of the Covenant was. And remember, on the Ark of the Covenant was the mercy seat between the two cherubim, Remember? You read the Word of God and you come to understand that God said, that's the designated place where I will meet with you. But really, that was the designated place where God would meet with who? With that intermediary. With the priest. Not just any priest. That was the place where God would come and He would meet with the high priest. You see, folks, only one priest, only the high priest could enter into the Holy of Holies where the ark was. And by the way, remember this too. The high priest could only enter into the Holy of Holies where the ark was on one day a year. Not every day for a limited time. Not every week, not every month. One day a year. If you're interested and want to learn more about that, check Leviticus chapter 16. Only the high priest could meet with God he could only do that on the Day of Atonement, only one day a year. And by the way, even then, this is interesting, even then, the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies. There was a veil. Remember, we're going to talk about this more in just a few minutes. There was a veil that separated the Holy of Holies from the holy place. Again, the Holy of Holies being where the ark was. The high priest could only go there again on that one day on the Day of Atonement. But even then, even on that one day, when he would go in, when he could go in, folks, do you know that he would go in with bells tied around his waist and a red cord tied to his ankle? Do you know why? Because if he hadn't first sacrificed properly to atone for his own sins, he would be struck dead by God. The bells would stop jingling and the other priests would need the rope to be able to pull his body out. Now compare that access. Compare that access to the access that we have to God as believers. We need no intermediary. Every believer in Christ, so important that you understand this, every believer in Christ is invited beckon to continually draw near to God without fear for the purpose of communing with Him. Now as we reflect on what we just learned about the high priest in the Old Testament, how can that be? How are we able to do that? How are we able to draw near to the Lord the way that, that we are? How do we have that access? Folks, the answer is that we're able to do that. 
we're able to draw near with that access because of the perfect sacrifice of Jesus on the cross for us. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. If you're familiar with the flow of Matthew's gospel, you know that in Matthew chapter 27, we find Jesus on the cross, right? What's Jesus doing there? I know that's a basic question. What's Jesus doing there? What is Jesus on the cross for? He was executed, remember, in the eyes of the Roman state for the cause of being an insurrectionist. He was executed, remember, by the Jews who prosecuted the case against him for blasphemy. Of course, he was neither an insurrectionist nor a blasphemer. By definition, God could be neither of those, right? So what was Jesus doing there? Well, Jesus was there, remember, to atone for the sins of believers. He was there to pay the price for your sins and for my sins and for those believers that Peter wrote to in Asia Minor so that through faith in Him, we can enter into relationship. Receive eternal life. That's what the cross was all about. Matthew chapter 27, verse 50 is right at the very end. Look at verse 50. Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Right? That's the death of the Son of God. Temporarily, of course. Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And now look at verse 51. And behold... The curtain of the temple. Remember the veil that we were talking about that separated the holy place from the holy of holies? That curtain. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. I want you to focus on that first statement. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Again, that's the veil that we talked about moments ago that separated the Holy of Holies from the holy place. What does that mean? Well, that means that that was the veil, that was the curtain that only the high priest could pass beyond and only on one day a year, only on the Day of Atonement. It was massive, by the way. It's thought that this was a, like a 60-foot curtain. Can you imagine Talk about a barrier. What does Matthew tell us? He tells us that it tore. It tore how? Well, it tore from the top down. That's an important detail. Why did it tear from the top down? Well, it tore from the top down to make it clear that God himself had ripped it open. So why did God rip it open? God ripped it open for this reason. He tore it from the top down for this reason. God tore it to certify that Christ's sacrifice had atoned fully for our sins. Thereby removing that barrier, listen to this, so that all who come to Him through faith have full and complete unfiltered access to Him. That's our first priestly privilege as believers. We have continual access to God through our union with Christ. Folks, remember this. If you're in Him, you're able to commune with the Father all the time, anytime you want to. That's a great priestly privilege, isn't it? Let's look at the second one. The second priestly privilege that's possessed by every believer in Jesus 
is the ability, or maybe better put, the responsibility of presenting spiritual sacrifices to God. Not only do we have access to God, we're to sacrifice to Him. Look at verse 5 again. You yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. Look at this, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We're to offer sacrifices to God. As believers, we obviously do not offer the sacrifices of animals the way that they did under the old covenant system. By the way, those sacrifices, as you think about those old covenant sacrifices, those sacrifices contained a worship component. But their primary purpose, again, thinking back on the old covenant sacrifices, their primary purpose was to provide a temporary covering for sin. Right? You understand that. But the coming of Jesus and His sacrifice for our sins on the cross was so perfect, so complete, that it has rendered those old covenant sacrifices obsolete. It's explained in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 11 and 12. Listen, the scripture here says, Every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. Look at verse 12. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God. Here's what that means. That means that the redemption of believers in Jesus is perfect. It means that it is complete. It means that it is a permanent redemption. So what does that mean as we think about 1 Peter chapter 2? And the sacrifices that we're to bring. Well, I think that what that means for us is that the sacrifices that we're to offer as believers, our sacrifices are purely sacrifices of worship. They're sacrifices of worship. We sacrifice to the Lord through our worship. Let's explore that. Turn to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Look at verse 1. Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to do something. Look, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world. See, he's explaining what those sacrifices look like. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, distilled to its essence, so look at those verses, distilled to its essence, the idea first and foremost is that we worship God how well we worship God by bringing our lives into conformance to His Word. Right? That's the way that we worship Him. It's by bringing our lives into conformance to His Word. What does His Word require? Well, we've seen this already in 1 Peter. God's Word requires that we do what? That we cast off sin. Remember? God's Word requires then positively that we walk in His ways. Folks, let's be very clear about something. Real worship is holy living. You understand that? We live in a time in the church where there's a lot of confusion about what worship is. It's thought that maybe worship is singing, or worse than that, worship is the songs that you sing. Or there are all kinds of crazy ideas out there. Uh, folks, praise is a component of worship. But listen to me very clearly here. Real worship is holy living. It's learning what the Word of God says. It's casting off sin. It's walking in obedience to the Word of God. 
You're going to worship God, then live a holy life. Real worship is holy living. Practically speaking, with that in mind, to give you some specifics here, the spiritual sacrifices of worship that Peter is calling for uh, would include things like prayer, like praise, like giving, like loving one another, like fellowship. Isn't it great to know that fellowship is worship? It is. Like serving one another, like studying the Word of God, sharing the gospel. See, there's great diversity in the ways that we worship. But what they all tie back into, the thing that they all share in common, is that they're all facets of holy living. Real worship is holy living. Folks, this ability, this calling to offer spiritual sacrifices to God, I want you to understand that that is a priceless privilege. Again, I think that it's common in our time to look at worship as maybe something that we can compartmentalize, something we do on Sunday, something that we do if we feel like it. Don't treat worship like that. Worship is a priceless privilege. It's a continual calling. Peter tells us that, by the way. Look at verse 7. Look at verse 7. He says in verse 7, so the honor, so this honor is for you who believe. See, Peter is saying that believers have blessed eternal life to look forward to. They have union with Christ. They have access to the Father continually. And they're richly blessed to be able to worship Him. To offer the spiritual sacrifices Peter wants us to understand that these are privileges of incalculable value. They're privileges of incalculable value. But understand this, folks. These are not privileges that are possessed by all. Peter tells us these are not privileges possessed by all. Keep reading. He says, the honor is for you who believe. The honor of worship is for you who believe. The honor of access is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe. It's a different story. For those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. And as you read that, I think that the thing that really stands out is that unbelief always stands in stark contrast to faith, doesn't it? Those who reject Jesus do not only miss out on the privileges given to believers. That's what Peter's telling us. They do not have access. They cannot worship through spiritual sacrifices. But they do not only miss out on those privileges. Peter is going further than that and he is telling us that for them, Christ becomes not a blessed cornerstone but rather a crushing stone of judgment. I think the point is this. The point is that you either embrace Jesus in faith and receive unfathomable privilege and receive unfathomable blessing. You either embrace Jesus in faith or listen, folks, you reject Him. There's no middle ground. You either receive him in faith or you reject him. And if you reject him, you are appointed to, what does Peter say? You're appointed to doom. Can we agree that it's a pretty easy choice here? It's a pretty easy choice, isn't it? By the way, this is interesting. The Greek is interesting here. The Greek... I want you to understand this important, important detail here. The Greek here leaves open the possibility that the unbelievers Peter was writing about might yet repent and be saved. Isn't that great? You know, we look at that and I, we, we just sort of see the finality there. The finality that comes through in the English translations is not in the Greek. The Greek leaves open that possibility that these unbelievers 
although in great peril, could yet repent, could yet be saved. You see, where does that come from? Well, that comes from verse 7. Look at it. Those who do not believe. You see that? The honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe. Those who do not believe, that translates a present tense verb. You know what that means? It means you could translate that this way. It could literally be translated, those not presently believing. Those not presently believing. By the way, you get down, I think it's in verse 9, you get down to verse 9, stumble and disobey. Those are also present tense verbs. See, the point is they were presently stumbling. They were presently disobeying the word. But the greater point is that the text affirms that their then present unbelief, their then present stumbling and disobedience were in God's plan. But here's the thing. That did not necessarily mean that some of them could not or would not later come to faith. Folks, I want to impress this on you very clearly. The unbelief that consigns to hell is the unbelief that is never repented of. Right? The unbelief that consigns to hell is the unbelief that's never repented of. And that brings us to the third blessed result of the believer's salvation. Their salvation reversed their purpose. It reversed their purpose, right? It reversed their purpose. They'd once been caught up in the self-centered sinful pursuits of this life like all unbelievers. We saw that in Ephesians chapter 2. But here's the thing. Peter is clear here that their salvation had made them worshipers. It had made them worshipers, right? They became priests who offer spiritual sacrifices to God. And add this now. Their salvation also made them evangelists. Their salvation also made them evangelists. Look at your Bible. We'll cover this quickly. Verse 9. Peter says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Keep reading. Why? So that you may proclaim. So that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you were God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Do you see the evangelistic calling there? The question is, to whom are believers to proclaim the excellencies of God? To whom are believers to extol the mercy of God? Keep reading. Verse 11, here's the answer. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Much more on that next week. But now look at this. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. Keep your conduct among the unbelieving honorable. Look at this. So that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and do what? And glorify God on the day of visitation. Did you get that? See, the answer to our question of who believers are to proclaim the excellencies of God to, of who believers are to extol the mercies of God to, the answer to that is that we're to proclaim the excellencies of the Lord's grace. We're to proclaim, extol His mercy to the unbelieving, to those presently living disobediently and on the way to judgment. We're to do that so that they might what? We're to do that, Peter says, so that they might glorify God on the day of visitation. In other words, we're to do that so that they may be saved. Folks, this calling that we have in Christ is an amazing calling, isn't it? It's 
Our salvation in Christ reverses our status from spiritually dead to being eternally spiritually alive. Our salvation in Christ reverses our position from that of profane sinner to being priests with access to God, called to offer Him spiritual sacrifices. And our salvation reverses our purpose from self-centeredly worldly pursuits to that of being proclaimers of the excellencies of God's grace. It's an amazing salvation. It's one that really overrules all of life's other circumstances, isn't it? It doesn't matter what your life is like day to day. Listen, in this life, persecution is real. It's going to become increasingly real. Pain, affliction, suffering, sorrow. These things are going to find you in this life. But what did we say about Peter's message? We said that it's a very simple message. We said that it's one that he never strays far from. And it's that if you embrace the sum of your salvation, if you make that your meditation, Peter says you'll have hope. Peter says that you'll be able to know, to experience, and to proclaim joy even in this life, even in the midst of the very worst that it can throw at you. It's the message of Peter and the recipients of a great salvation. Would you pray with me? Father, we're grateful for uh, your love. Lord, we're grateful for your grace. Father, we're grateful for this amazing salvation that we are the recipients of. Father, thank you for Jesus. Lord, thank you for his work for us on the cross, making it all possible. Father, thank you for your Holy Spirit who convicts of sin. Lord, who confirms in us the truth and the veracity, the rightness of Scripture and the reality of the gospel who draws us to you, Lord, so that in faith we can believe and be saved. Father, we think this morning uh, of anyone here, Lord, or maybe watching online who has not yet uh, entered in, Father, to faith. Lord, we just lift them up to you. Father, we pray that you would pierce their heart with the needful conviction Lord, cause them to see the reality of their sin and the the great depth of their need for salvation. Lord, we give the rest of this day to you, Father. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.